So our first paper presentation is for joint synthesis of safety certificate and safe control policy, which I think is very relevant to what Chuchu discussed, using constrained reinforcement learning. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Tian Hong. Today I'm presenting this work on behalf of the authors because they can make it to the conference. I'm glad to have this opportunity. Well, actually not because my own work only gets a poster. All right. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so this work mainly focuses on the energy function based safety certificates, which has been mentioned many times today, but just in case I still give a quick recap. So the energy functions are widely used in control theory to prove safety, stability, and reachability, extra. The main idea of energy function is that desired system states, such as safe states, should be assigned with low energy, and the system will converge to the desired states if the energy is dissipating. For example, Lyapunov function, control barrier function, and safety index all belong to energy functions. And in this figure, for example, uh, our goal is that the system should always stay in the desired state, state, which is also a forward environment state. Therefore, states inside the site should be assigned with low energy. With the safety certificates, we could use them to synthesize safe controllers. First, we synthesize the certificates from given safety specifications, such as the robot should always keep a safety distance from human. If there is a dynamic model, we could easily obtain the control safe set. The control safe set should satisfy the feasibility requirement that dissipates the system energy. After that, if we also have a nominal controller, we could use the control safe set to synthesize the safe controller. However, in this way, we must know the dynamic model and the nominal controller, and we must guarantee that the control safe set satisfy the feasibility requirement. This requirement actually poses great challenges without dynamic model or nominal controllers. Many studies have, uh, have utilized learning-based approaches to handle these challenges. Some studies learn feasible energy functions. However, they usually assume they have prior dynamic models or controllers. Some also use learning-based method to learn safe control policies but they usually assume that they have a feasible certificate. A recent study proposed a joint synthesized algorithm. However, their approach is intuitive. They just iteratively update to learning processes and there is no solid convergence guarantees. To summarize them, the real challenge in joint synthesize of certificates and control policy is that if you want to learn one, you must know the prior other one. If we do not know either of them, we cannot judge if a certificate is feasible or if a policy is safe. Therefore, the joint synthesis is more like a hen egg paradox. Let us first explain the problem formulation. The most important thing in learning the feasible safety certificate is that we must guarantee the persistent feasibility, such that there must exist actions to deceive to dissipate the system energy. We could formalize a loss function to optimize the safety index parameters, so then to minimize the inevitable energy, energy function increases, or the constraint violations of this inequality constraint. We use the constraint reinforcement learning to learn safe control policies. Here, the constraints are posed on each state, and this problem, we use a Lagrangian-based solution with multiplier network proposed in our previous study. Notably, this problem formulation is different from the traditional constrained Markov decision process. In the constrained Markov decision process setting, the constraints are posed on a single Markov decision process. So the constraints are irrelevant with the states. If you use Lagrangian-based method to solve the constrained MDP, the Lagrangian multiplier is just a scalar. 
However, in our case, the Lagrangian multiplier is relevant with states. So we use a neural network to approximate the mapping from the states through its corresponding Lagrangian multiplier. A small summary is that we have two formulation problems. Formulation one is certificate learning and the other is policy learning. So how to, how to unify these two learning algorithms to learn objectives? Our solution is the joint adversarial optimization. First, we prove that we, we prove that we unify the loss function in the policy loss function if we have the optimal safe policy and optimal multiplier pair. This optimal multiplier actually filters out the constraint violation terms, just like what we did in formalizing the safety certificate loss function. Therefore, we could get this linear correlation between the two loss functions. Using the Evolux theorem, we could unify the policy and certificate learning in this joint adversarial optimization procedure. Intuitively, the inner loop is the policy learning part where we aim to get the worst case energy increases. And the outer loop is actually the certificate learning process where we minimize the worst case energy increases. The result of this adversarial optimization is that our worst case energy increases converge to zero. And this means we get the feasible safety certificates and also the safe control policies. In our paper, we also provide convergence guarantees. Uh, you could check it if you are interested. We conduct these experiments on the safety gym, a commonly used reinforcement learning benchmark. The agents must avoid the hazards to achieve the goal. We use the safety index parameterization in our previous work. We compare our algorithm with some baseline algorithm. RL, including RL with empirical energy function, RL with safety certificates, uh, RL with safety specification as the energy function, and common constraint reinforcement learning algorithm provided in the safety gene. We compare the episodic constraint violations on tasks with different hazard size. The training result uh, shows our proposed algorithm guarantees safety and the uh, zero constraint violation on both sides of hazards. While the empirical safety certificates only works on the smaller hazards, for the environment with larger hazards, there still exists constraint violation even after convergence. As for other baseline algorithms, they all have difficulties achieving zero constraint violation on either environment. The results show that they actually learn the feasible safety certificate and solid safe control policies. Moreover, we want to visualize the forward environment site. We use a simplified environment. This red line is the boundary of the true maximum forward environment site, which is numerically solved by the Hamilton Jacobian reachability analysis. States outside this red line is the, actually the forward environment site because uh, the obstacle is at the center. So before the synthesize, the uh, sub zero level set of the certificate is outside uh, the green line. So we observe that there still exists some unsafe states. Therefore, this certificate is actually not feasible. After synthesized, the sub-zero level set is outside of the green line. It shows that we get a feasible subset of the true maximum forward environment site. And the results show that we really learn a feasible safety certificate in the algorithm. And in summary, um, Joint synthesize of a policy on the certificate is hard because this is actually a hen egg paradox. When we do not know a prior certificate or safe policies, we use the adversarial optimization with the unified loss functions to handle this paradox. Our open source implementation is on GitHub. Uh, thank you for listening. Question? For one question, if anybody has a question. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have one question. So 
you, we are handling a black box system. We are trying to synthesize the certificate and the control at the same time. So do we have any requirement regarding the unknown system, for example, in the form of um, nonlinear affine, or it's just a black box? We do not have any requirement. Uh, it's Thank just you. a black box. OK. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next talk is, is experience replay with likelihood free important plates. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Jiaming Song, and today I am presenting our work on uh, experience replay with likelihood free importance weights. Uh, this, I am uh, presenting this work on the behalf of my uh, collaborators, uh, Sam Finha, Anna Mesh uh, Garg, and uh, Stefan Irma. So, I guess everyone uh, here in the audience are uh, relatively familiar with in reinforcement learning, and one of the very a uh, common paradigm in reinforcement learning is uh, this Q-learning. So in the Q-learning, uh, you know, we get some uh, experiences from the environment, store that in the replay buffer, and use that to learn this Q-network. And usually this Q-network is learned to fit the target uh, such that uh, it, it fits, tries to fit what would be the best uh, you know, Q function. And we can basically use that as, uh, to, to derive a policy uh, there. And here, the target is actually, uh, you know, taking what would be the maximum Q for like your next transition. So in this case, it's a Bellman op optimality uh, operator. And there has been a lot of uh, works uh, starting from a uh, prioritized experience replay, perhaps in 2015, that tries to uh, reweight the replay buffer, and in order to get a uh, much better performance than just randomly sampling from the buffer. Uh, today our topic is slightly different. So we are, instead of talking about actor critic algorithm, which is slightly different, but also a very dominant uh, type of algorithm in, uh, in model-free reinforcement learning. So here uh, we have an actor that actually uh, represents a policy, it uh, queries the environment. The environment gives the, uh, the, you know, the transitions stored in the replay buffer, and the critic may use that uh, you know, and the actor uh, experience to uh, form this uh, Q function, but this Q function is not the optimal Q function. It's the Q function related to this policy. So the target is actually this Bellman evaluation uh, operator. So it's different from what we would typically do in uh, Q learning. So one thing would be interesting is that, you know, since our target is different, so what a priority weighting strategy, you know, that suits for Q learning, does it still work for uh, actor critic, and in this case, we actually show uh, in our paper that perhaps there is another alternative that actually improves uh, sample efficiency in uh, actor critic algorithms just by reweighting the uh, experience uh, replay buffer, and we call this me our method likelihood free importance weights. So our high level idea is to uh, f is to first we find that uh, once you define a weight, let's call it here is uh, W, uh, and we we apply this weight onto every sample in this uh, replay buffer. And let's call the distribution of uniformly sampling from the replay buffer uh, D, the distribution D of E. And we will call this distribution D of W as D of E multiplied by W uh, is normalized. So we can essentially think of this new objective after reweighting as not doing this reweighting after sampling, but uh, choosing a different distribution, this so-called priority distribution here of reweighted uh, of the sampling. So it would be equivalent to as if we uniformly draw from this priority distribution. Uh, so one interesting question is, what kind of priority distribution should we use? 
And instead of the ones that are derived in uh, Q learning, we actually propose to use the uh, stationary distribution, which is essentially the uh, sort of the limit of the uh, what your policy uh, rollouts will currently give you. And this is uh, the reason for doing this is that one reason we motivate this is actually considering how this uh, build my evaluation operator uh, like typically people when people derive convergence updates. Uh, people usually use this infinity norm, which ca uh, characterizes the distance of, across the worst state action pair. But however, if we make a big mistake in the worst state action pair, but did pretty well on all the average state action pairs, then we might actually use this, this new Q function still might do pretty well when we are using it to update the actor. So our intuition is to consider instead an ac uh, average distance, but not the worst distance. And we actually have some theory in the paper that shows that if you define a norm based on the stationary distribution, uh, it actually has very good contraction properties uh, uh, with the Bellman evaluation operator. So how do we implement this in practice? Uh, obviously, we cannot actually sample infinite experiences from this current policy. Uh, so we instead consider, uh, you know, first let's consider two strategies. The first strategy considers only the experiences from the current policy. I denote this in blue, and on the on the uh, right plot I have this data set, and I use the top blue plot to show that it is a very, you know, a few number of the current policy. So technically speaking, it will have lower bias because the samples are actually from the correct policy, uh, but it will have higher variance because there's very few samples. A strategy two is simpler. We just use all the experiences from all the policies. So this will typically have a higher bias than what we would do with the priority distribution because samples are from multiple policies and therefore they are different. And, but also because there are more samples, they have lower variance. And because these experiences reflect uh, the, you know, in, in some sense reflect the dynamics of the environment, we want to make use of them. So we are interested in having a lower bias, lower variance strategy by, using, uh, by comparing the two of them. So here is our goal. So let's suppose that our previous, uh, you know, uh, the first case constitutes this fast uh, repeated buffer, which is smaller, and the uh, the, the green one, uh, the all the experiences constitutes this slow replay buffer, uh, which is larger. And we basically try to target our weight to uh, to reweight the slow buffer into the target bu uh, faster buffer. So the target weight would be the density of the fast buffer divided by the density of the slow buffer. And we can actually, uh, although it is, you know, we never actually get the densities for all the state action pairs explicitly, we can actually learn these weights by binary classification, and these learned weights can be used in the critic update. So the way we do this is as follows. So basically, we constitute the fast buffer and the slow buffer. We use the classifier to, to train it to classify if it's from the fast buffer or it's from the slow buffer. And after training this classifier, we can use it to reweight our critic and then use that to use the updated critic updates to uh, you know, proceed training the actor. And in uh, various experiments on uh, OpenIGM, for example, uh, we can implement these algorithms on uh, various uh, algorithms such as uh, uh, soft actor critic and uh, TD3. And the, on, the, on the left uh, most column, the blue column is the base algorithm, which is uh, what the typical performance that would that are be expect. And the rightmost column is our method. And the middle columns correspond to several different strategies uh, of reweighting the, the replay buffer, including prioritized experience replay and others. And we can see that on most of the cases, we outperform these different methods. And we also have different uh, experiment results on a deep mind control suite, and these are uh, based on software actor critic uh, algorithms. But we also tried our methods on different uh, methods, such as uh, DRQ, which, uh, although we don't have much theory to back it up, we still uh, outperform the existing uh, uh, baselines. So, uh, and if you're interested, please check out our paper, and we also have more ablation studies in the paper. Uh, so that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, could you please go back to the, the results slide? Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> uh, this page? Or? Yeah, I was, uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, the other one. Okay. I was, I, I didn't have a chance to look at all the numbers, but it seems like the prioritized experience replay performs worse than the baseline. Um, I was kind of wondering if you, if you could talk about why this is, because. Uh, yes, uh, as we said, yeah, we were also quite surprised to find this. 
Uh, I think one of the reasons, again, was that Prioritize Experience Replay was designed for queue learning. Therefore, it was a good strategy if you want to learn the optimal queue function. But it might not be the optimal strategy if you want to learn uh, the, you know, for actor critic, which is a different target that you want to learn. So, uh, yeah, we were also quite surprised that we found that Prioritize Experience Replay, when you directly plug in the default hyperparameters, seem to work worse than the base algorithms. Uh, but this is what we find. And actually, in the second page, we also had uh, prioritized experience to play plus our method, which also seems to be worse uh, on, the, on the first column here, a fourth column here, which also seems to be worse than just applying our uh, likelihood-based reweighting. OK, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank, thank our speaker again. <laughs>So our next talk is a structured neural pruning via sparse signal recovery. I didn't pronounce your acronym because I wasn't sure how you wanted to pronounce it. I'm not really sure either. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the, sorry. Thank you. So, uh, hi everybody, I'm Cameron Wolf. I'm coming from Rice University in Houston, Texas. And today I'll be presenting my paper called ISPASP, which is just a provable neural network pruning algorithm that's inspired by sparse signal recovery. Um, so the first question you may have is basically just what is neural network pruning? Um, so basically the idea is that typically we'll have some neural network that's very large. Um, we've trained it to accomplish some task and we wanna discover some smaller version of this neural network that kind of maintains the performance. So this was originally popularized, maybe not originally, but it got very popular with the proposal of the lottery ticket hypothesis, and there are a bunch of different works that have studied this and tried to find ways that we can take some big, big neural network, then find a smaller one that performs the same. So obviously the implications of this would be um, less memory overhead, um, less power usage, things like this. Maybe we can deploy the neural network onto a robot or something like this easier. And typically, this follows a three-step process. So we first pre-train the neural network, so take some big data set and teach it to predict things properly on the data set. Then we'd prune the neural network, so take away some groups of weights and stuff like this, and then we'd fine-tune it to make sure that it still performs properly. Um, the problem is most of the existing methods for pruning are heuristic. So these are all empirical things where we show that they work well in experiments, and this is fine for like low risk tasks like recommendation systems and other areas where deep learning is very common. But for high risk scenarios, you know, control scenarios where your neural network is actually predicting what a robot should do and there are consequences for what the neural network predicts, it's kind of nice to have things where we know how they perform. So this is where provable pruning techniques come in. So kind of in parallel to these empirical techniques that people propose that are all purely heuristic, people have kind of come up with algorithms that have theoretical guarantees for pruning. Um, so the idea is instead of like following some heuristic that we prove in practice, let's write some theory about it and see if we can come up with an algorithm that performs just as well but has kind of performance guarantees associated with it. And um, there's been a lot of theoretical analysis, but a recent paper called Greedy Ford Selection is the first that actually shows good practical performance along with theoretical guarantees. So the idea behind this is to take a Frank Wolf style algorithm. So here if we look at the figure, you start out with a network. We say we're going to remove the entire hidden layer and then slowly test neurons one by one, adding them into the network, and then exhaustively select the, neural, uh, the neurons that we should include. So you add one neuron at a time until you arrive at your desired sparsity level, and then you end up with a sparse neural network with like similar performance. So this is shown to actually perform better than a lot of heuristic methods, but the problem is it's really slow. So the question that I set out to answer is there's some algorithm out there that comes with the theoretical guarantees, um, performs well in practice, but is also efficient enough to compare to the heuristic algorithms. So my proposal is called ISPASP. Um, 
It stands for Iterative Sparse Structured Pruning, and it's inspired by the COSAMP algorithm, which is an algorithm for sparse signal recovery. And the basic idea behind ISPAS is that we first take, so for performing structured pruning, um, we look at neurons or maybe filters within a CNN, and the first step of ISPASP is we basically say, let's look at all of these filters or neurons that we have and associate some importance metric with them. So in this case, the importance is basically um, characterizes if we add this filter or neuron into the sparse network, how, how much will that impact the disparity, disparity to the actual like big network? So we want to find the neurons that if we put them into the network, it will make the output similar to the original dense network. From here, we take all of the most impor important neurons and combine them with whatever candidate set we have. So we're kind of refining a group of neurons that we want in our sparse network. And then we prune them to some smaller size based on the magnitude of their hidden activations. So step one, estimate their importance. Take these and combine them with your candidate set and then prune that to your desired sparsity level. So however small you want your neural network to be based on how big their hidden activations are. Then we compute a new residual, so this is the difference between in the output between your prune network and the actual original network, and then just keep iterating in this fashion. So we're iteratively reducing the disparity between the output of our sparse network and the output of the dense network. And the benefits of this is that it's actually a lot faster than the greedy forward selection variants. It comes with similar theoretical guarantees, and it actually performs well in large-scale experiments. So if we want to understand why it's actually more efficient, the basic reason behind this is that when we look at the importance metric that we're using, all it is is basically a loss function. So our loss function is what is like the L2 distance between the output of the sparse network and the output of the dense network. And then we can use this to compute importance of neurons or filters. So this is actually super easy to, to compute because we can do it with automatic differentiation. So you can do this for convolutional neural networks, feed-forward neural networks, transformers, whatever. Because you're using automatic differentiation, it's all the same and it's always like pretty efficient to compute. And that's what we see in the right figure here. So if we look at the timing of how long it takes to actually prune layers of a ResNet, we see that the GFS variants are the red and green bars, and then ISPASP is the purple one. We basically improve upon the efficiency of pruning by an order of magnitude. So because we can Im implement with automatic differ differentiation, it's super fast. Um, then the question is, like, what kind of theoretical guarantees do we get with this? So the first um, scenario that we analyze is for two-layer networks. So we consider feed-forward neural networks, and we make a couple of assumptions, namely that the output weight matrix is obeys the restricted isometry pop property and then the, the hidden representations of the network are row compressible. And what that means is basically that if we look at the network's representations across the entire data set, basically they're somewhat sparse. It characterizes the level of sparsity within the hidden representations so that if we have a low row compressibility factor, um, the neural network representations are very sparse and vice versa. And um, interestingly, what we find is that if we kind of analyze the error between the pruned network and the dense network um, using the ISPAS algorithm, it will decay polynomially with the number of iterations of ISPAS that you run. So interestingly, basically this decay rate depends upon the compressibility factor of the hidden representation. So what we find is that if we have a lower compressibility ratio, we get a faster decay rate. So what this tells us is that if a neural network's hidden representations are sparse, the pruning basically works better, which seems like a pretty simple finding um, that would hold in practice, but this has never actually been shown by any previous paper. There's never been a paper that has shown like the actual quality of the prune network depends on um, the sparsity of the dense network. Then if we extend this to multi-layer networks, what we see is that the rate is like basically the same. We get this polynomial decay rate um, to where the pruning error decays as we add more neurons to our prune network, but there's just an extra factor that tells us if we prune an earlier layer, we're going to have to propagate that um, error through the rest of the network and so forth. So from here, um, we now know that this algorithm is efficient. It comes with theoretical guarantees that are actually kind of interesting. The question is now, does it actually perform well in experiments? So 
To answer this, we analyze feed-forward neural networks, a couple of different types of CNNs, and then a BERT model on just usual data sets that you would use. So for the feed-forward neural network, we take CIFAR-10 images and um, flatten them into a vector, perform classification. We use ImageNet for the CNNs, and then for the BERT model, we use a multi-language um, classification data set. So what we see for the feed-forward neural networks is that if we perform no fine-tuning, greedy forward selection works really well, so the accuracy of the model is good. But the reason for this is because the objective when you're pruning with greedy forward selection is to minimize training loss. So without any fine tuning after pruning, it performs pretty well because the, um, the objective of the pruning process is to actually make um, the network minimize loss. Then if we run more fine tuning though, we see that the networks discovered through iSPAS are actually better. So even though the objective of the iSPAS algorithm is not to actually just minimize training loss, we have our importance metric that we defined. Um, typically, it finds a set of neurons that can better recover accuracy um, if we perform some fine tuning. When we take then um, larger scale experiments, so BERT on the multi-language classification data set, we see that compared to both heuristic baseline methods and some kind of simple baseline methods like uniformly pruning the transformer, um, ISPAS performs better pretty consistently. Similarly, for ResNet, we see that ISPAS consistently outperforms all of the heuristic baseline methods and performs si similarly to greedy forward selection. And then for MobileNet, um, the findings are pretty much similar. It outperforms a lot of heuristic baseline methods and performs similarly to greedy forward selection. So the takeaway here is basically that ISPASP is a pruning methodology that's inspired by sparse signal recovery, and it's a pruning algorithm that's pro provable, so meaning that it comes with theoretical guarantees that tell us that it should perform well given proper assumptions. It's practical because it's efficient. Um, its efficiency is comparable to most of the common heuristic methodologies. Um, uh, well, actually practical, so it performs well in all of the large-scale experiments, and then it's efficient because it runs much faster than previous provable methodologies. So the idea is that this is hopefully a step towards having some algorithms with neural networks that actually come with theoretical guarantees so that we can use them in um, applications beyond just low-risk scenarios. So thank you. A quick first question. Mm -hmm. So when you do the neural network node pruning, is that a network that's already been trained? Yeah, so typically, and so there are some works that like prune randomly initialized networks, but the typical workflow is that you take some pre-trained network, prune it, and then fine tune it after the pruning, yeah. I see, that makes sense. So I get that, so training can take a lot of time Mm -hmm. So I think people would be really excited about what it might look like to incorporate some of the pruning during training so that you could start to cut out some of that time. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you've done any thinking about what that might look like in terms of your work and these provable guarantees that you've been able to do. Yeah, so that's actually what I'm working on right now, but there are a lot of ideas that we can take from like convex and non-convex optimization, like basically objectives where there's some sort of thresholding involved. So there's sparsity where we say we're only going to select a portion of the neurons, but in addition to doing the thresholding, you're actually manipulating the weights of the neurons as you go. So I'm definitely, that's what I'm working on right now, and it's like a very good future direction so that you can avoid the pre-training step because that's way more expensive than pruning and fine tuning. Thank you. Just a quick question. So, so do you have a sense of how this compares with uh, uh, things like minimizing L1 norm, like the optimal brain surgeon? Yeah, so um, that's basically the go-to baseline methodology is that we just take the neural network and prune um, weights with the lowest L1 norm, right? So that's actually included in here, um, like basically filter pruning, if you see, so top method there, Lee et al. Filter pruning is just L1 weight pruning, right? So that's the go-to heuristic methodology, and we outperform those usually. Oh, 
All right, thank you again. Thank you. So the last talk of this session is uh, distributed stochastic Nash equilibrium learning in locally coupled network games with unknown parameters. So hi, everybody. I would like to introduce the work that Dr. Hu and I have done so far regarding a distributed learning approach in locally coupled network games with unknown parameters. So for a very typical stochastic Nash equilibrium problem, there exists a group of player. Each player aims to optimize its own local objective functions. So this objective function not only depends on the decision made by this player I, but also depends on the decisions made by others. At the same time, we assume that here this, ob this objective function may also subject to some random noise. And the solution concept considered in this paper is stochastic Nash equilibrium, where no players can benefit by unilaterally deviating from this point. Such type of problem setup can describe a lot of applications, such as traffic congestion control problem, the channel allocation in cognitive radio networks, etc. So in this work, we will restrict our, to our attention to a specific network games, where the interactions between each pair of players are characterized by an underlying communication network. This communication network is assumed to be connected and without self-loops. In addition, we also assume that the communication over this network um, is um, undirectional. And each player only allows to communicate with its neighbors, i.e. in neighbors and all neighbors, but not the other players that may be too far away from them and not, uh, and not their direct neighbors. And we say that it works in a partial information setting. And the specific form of the scenario-based objective function for player I admits the following form. So it is parameterized by some neighboring aggregate function SI, which is some affine function of the decisions made by its in neighbors and crafted by some random noise, because I, I here. And it may also, also worth mentioning that here the parameter W star may be unknown to the parameters. So it may reflect the cases where player are the players are uncertain about their complex environment and hence have some unknown parameters in their models and would like to improve their parameters based on the observation they make up to this point. And so our goal in this work is to couple the two processes, the Nash equilibrium seeking process and the parameter learning process. And by following the proposed algorithm, this group of players can reach a Nash equilibrium. So the very intuitive framework to solve this type problem is given here. At each iteration, each player will first update its local decision based on some proper rule, but parameterized by some parameter estimate, not the exact parameter. And then the player will make observation about the um, realized objective values or some other type of feedback and use that to improve their parameter estimate. So a very quick but implete uh, review about the existing work. In Nash equilibrium seeking problem, there is lots of work solving them through the avenue of operator splitting. But uh, they usually assume that the players, each player has perfect knowledge of their objective function. And recently, there exists an emerging research interest in solving this type of, so in solving this type of problem through the through the, um, through the method of the bandit online learning scheme. And they suppose that the players are completely oblivious to the underlying game mechanism while making their decisions merely based on the observed objective values. 
but usually they need to assume some type of smoothness. For example, it is usually assumed Lipschitz continuity for the pseudo gradient for the scheme considered. And for the existing work sitting between these two ends, um, people are looking at learning Nash equilibria while confronted with unknown parameters. So um, they are, um, but nevertheless, for the existing work, they either decouple the two processes, the parameter, they implement the parameter estimation process and the Nash equilibrium seeking completely independently, or they assume some scalar unknown parameter and the best response, demand, then the best response updates is contractive. So to briefly introduce our designed algorithm, uh, we will start with the case when the parameter W star are assumed to be known, and our previous introduced problem can be reduced to a deterministic Nash equilibrium seeking problem. So the KKT conditions for our solution concept, the stochastic Nash equilibrium, is given here, and it consists of the partial subgradient of local objectives and the normal corn associated with the local feasible set. And to enable distributed computation of the Nash equilibrium, uh, we will associate each player with, a, uh, with some local estimates for the decisions of its in neighbors. For example, the player I on this figure has two in neighbors, the player J and L. And player I, in addition, uh, in addition to keeping its uh, local decision YII, it also needs to maintain two local estimates, YIJ and YIL, to check the decisions made by its in neighbors. After introducing the local estimates, we then uh, will reformulate the formal KKT conditions for the um, stochastic Nash equilibrium into the following form. So we introduce a selection matrix and the extended pseudo gradient to take the local estimation into account. And to enforce the correct estimation of others' decisions, an additional matrix, the Laplacian matrix tilde L here is introduced. And it can be proved that the solution sets for the above to zero inclusions coincide in some sense. And with the distributed version of KKT conditions in hand, we will then try to solve the zero finding problem through, the, uh, through some fixed point iteration. And the first step is we will choose some rows sufficiently large to make the uh, operator T, which is the uh, denote the expression above, to be uh, to possess some monotonicity or, restrict mon or restricted monotonicity. And um, after that, uh, we will solve the zero finding problem through proximal point algorithm, or proximal point algorithm, or PPA. And to simplify the computation of the resolvent involved, we will design a positive definite matrix phi here, which is just some um, diagonal matrix minus the previously introduced Laplacian matrix. And we also leverage the um, Karsner cell scheme man iteration here along with the PPA for the later convergence analysis. And our first convergence result suggests that under this deterministic under this deterministic setting with proper tau and rho, the sequence generated by PPA will converge to a zero of t, and the decisions made by this group of players will converge to the Nash equilibrium. We will next move on to the case where the parameter W star is, are unknown to the players, and players can only observe some realized noisy objective values. So uh, to begin with, each player is expected to make some updates about its local decisions and local estimates using a single round of proximal point algorithm we just introduced. But now this update is parameterized not by the exact parameter W star, but by the parameter estimate W hat. After each player determines its um, updated local decisions, we will then perturb the decisions that this player is going to play for this iteration. And we also leverage a safe net trick to pull the perturbed decision a little bit towards an inner point of the feasible set to ensure the feasibility of the results. 
After that, each player will observe the realized noisy objective value and the decisions made by its neighbors. In the last step, each player will utilize an ordinary least square estimator to update to improve its parameter estimation and redo the iteration. So for the convergence analysis for the proposed algorithm, we have the following theorem, which suggests the relationship between the parameter, uh, the parameter estimation error and the convergence of the proposed algorithm. So it says that if the sequence, the gamma k times the parameter estimation error is a summable sequence in an almost sure sense, then the generated sequence will converge to a zero of, oper of the operator t almost surely. And our next results saying something about the decaying rate of the parameter estimation error. So it says that um, on a on a random sample set with probability one. For any random samples omega hat from this set, starting from some iteration, the, 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 parameter, the parameter approximation error will decay at a rate approximating one over the square root of k. And our theoretical results are verified using a nash connor production gain here. And we use the blue curve to represent the deterministic experiments, while the green curve to uh, denote the experiments coupled with parameter estimation process. So I will stop here. Thanks for your listening. And I will be open to any questions from the audience. This concludes our uh, second oral sessions. Let's give our speakers another round of applause.